Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Shar. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Hello, friends. How are you? This is Aaron, and this is a flashback Friday to an interview we did last year at Sundance, January 2020, with director Ramona Diaz and hip-hop activist and one of our best friends of the show, we like to say, Ruby Ibarra. They um, are a part of a film called A Thousand Cuts, which will be debuting on Frontline tonight, Friday, January 8th, on uh, most, if not all, PBS stations across the country. This film is about journalist Maria Ressa, who has risked her life and freedom as an outspoken critic of Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs. And we did not plan this, obviously. Um, We knew this film was going to air, um, I don't know, a couple months ago. So we put it on the calendar, not knowing that our own dictator was going to incite a riot in Washington, D.C. this week. And um, yeah, timing is everything. So if you have the chance to watch this film tonight, again on Frontline, please do. Please support women uh, filmmakers and women journalists. It's called A Thousand Cuts, and enjoy our interview. Thank you so much for being here, ladies. We are delighted to talk about this film. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Ramona. Can you please tell us a little bit about A Thousand Cuts? So A Thousand Cuts is really um, a look at the Philippines under President Duterte at this time, through the backdrop of... Um, uh, the midterm elections, and specifically through the point of view of one journalist who is speaking out against Duterte, Maria Ressa. Um, and so we look at uh, the drug war through the prism of disinformation and, um, and press freedom. Sounds a lot like a country I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure sounds, what you're talking about. I, sounds I, very you familiar. <laughs> yeah, the parallels are uncanny. Uh, but how did you meet Maria and, and learn about Rappler and, and, and get into this? I knew I wanted to do a film about Duterte and the drug war because, like, in 2016, I started seeing all these horrific photos on my Facebook page. And, it, it, you know, there were photos I couldn't turn away from, right? I mean, I built a career on telling Filipino and Filipino-American stories. So it was one thing that was I was being drawn to. So I had this idea of making this film about Duterte and the drug war, not really knowing what it was. So I was on the ground in Manila in, like, May 18, 2018, mid-2018. And I met a lot of, uh, you know, opposition and people in his inner circle just trying to figure out how to tell the story. And I thought, you know, I should really talk to journalists. And the loudest voice against Duterte at that time was Rappler and Maria Ressa. So one thing led to another. I met her. um, And actually, I have a funny story about that. If we have time, I can tell you later. But we met her. and, uh, And then one thing led to another. And, you know... Access takes time in documentaries, especially the kinds of documentaries I do. They're very immersive. Mm -hmm. So you have to stay a long time. Presence is key. Mm -hmm. Um, But she gave us full access in the end. Yeah. And you um, just mentioned Facebook, and I was really struck by the numbers of um, uh, social media users in the Philippines. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah. For three years running now, we um, Filipinos spend the most time on social media, like 10 hours a day. Uh, which is crazy. It is a social media uh, country. Well, we were at the texting capital before texting ever became a thing. I remember visiting in, what was it, late the late 90s? And everyone was texting. I had no idea what it was. Like, <laughs> On their flip phone? It, yes. Okay. I mean, it was before everyone, <laughs> right. everyone, before everyone was texting, I, I'm, before the aughts, so yeah, before yeah. 2000s. Um, and they were also good at it with those small keyboards you know, like, <laughs> where you had to press five times to get to what you want. Um, T9. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they've always been ahead, and I think it's um, has to do with the national character. We hate saying no, so texting is perfect, <laughs> right? Because you don't even have to reply, 
right? Um, so it, we're non-confrontational. So social media is great. <laughs> Texting is great. So it really, really aligns with the national character. I'm so just, I'm not surprised. I'm just laughing because my two teammates here are Filipina. Yeah, that, so that you true, have though? totally... Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you for... Yes. She could probably uh, admit that that's exactly what you just described is how to she deals with, two, with the two of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You hit the nail on the passive-aggressive yeah. head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Ruby, I want to get you in on, yeah. the, on the conversation how did you get involved with this project? Um, I was honored to receive a, an email from their team one day and they were asking if, I think they were initially looking at one of my music that I had produced um, prior from mm -hmm. um, my previous album. And as a conversation continued around, you know, making this music for the specific film, um, I think it was, it might have been Ramona's idea to yeah. bring up, um, why don't we create something original um, specifically for this documentary? And, um, you know, we were in a very tight uh, time frame. Mind you, this was also during the holidays. But at the same time, just me being such a big fan of Maria's work and also having just uh, recently learning about Ramona's work as well. Um, so kind of a, a side story, I, I met Ramona and Maria in person for the first time when I was out in the Philippines. Um, I actually had a chance to perform at the Rappler Studios mm -hmm. um, last year in March. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, I think, during the time where Maria had just gotten arrested again. And um, me and my band were unaware that she was actually already released. So we were in the middle of uh, filming our performance and then in walks in Maria into the office. And then I'm just there trying to keep my composure and remembering my lyrics. I'm like, oh my right. God, it's Maria Ressa who yeah. just walked into she's the room. She's a superhero. Yeah. And yeah, for me, she, she definitely is an icon. She's a superhero. And what I love about her and Ramona too is that they're both Penais who are fearless in the work that they do. And um, I think that very much aligns with my values and also my artistry. So when it came to the opportunity of um, creating an original song for this movie, of course I had to say yes, and I wanted to be a part of it um, in any chance that I could. And it totally makes sense. I mean, Ange and I know who you are, yeah. but I think the audience is listening doesn't know who you are. So so happy that you were brought on board for this film. It makes total sense. So. It was an honor. Yeah. No, it's just great. Yeah, I have to say, I've never been so excited <laughs> to wait for the credits. I'm like, where's the song? <laughs> Let me hear it. It's so it's so good. This is like the perfect marriage. But you don't understand. She can't, I mean, we were all like crazy trying to get through the finish line, right? And this idea of creating an original song at like the 12th hour. <laughs> but she just jumped in. She's like, sure. I'm like, okay, here's the film. We sent her a link. And the first thing she sent back, we were like all blown away. I mean, she totally got it the first time. There were a few things, you know, tweaks here and there. But for the most part... It's what she has submitted for the very first time. It's just great. It's I mean, amazing. It's the premise of the doc. Strong women make things happen. There you I go. I mean, this Rappler yeah. is not backed by any big business. It's run by women. Yes. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the filming of this because, you know, Maria puts herself right on the front lines. Uh, so did you or your crew ever feel uh, threatened or, or any certain way by following her and just kind of like, all right, make a sign of the cross and jump in? That Basically that. <laughs> right? I mean, there's a scene in the film where... Um, Maria's talking to her sister, right? Mm -hmm. One of the hotel scenes. Yes. And, and Maria's saying, you know, you just figure it out and you just do it, right? You're, if you're good with it, you do it. I think that's how I felt. Like, if I had thought about it too much, I would, I think, um, fear would have gotten uh, the better of me. And But I think that in years to come, I would have regretted not doing this. I'm a documentary filmmaker. If I shied away from this, I think the big regret, it would have been. So the imagined regret was stronger than the fear mm. at that moment. So I just did. I, I knew it was the right thing to do. Um, my concern was the local crew who had to stay behind, mm -hmm. right? So we had to have that conversation. We are leaving after the shoot. You're staying. Yeah. It's perfectly okay if you don't want to still be involved right I mean we gave them a way out and each and every one of them stayed they said no this is a good this is the right story to tell and we should tell it it was amazing yeah and uh, the gut punch of hearing the war on drugs again I was like this this was already done in the US and it didn't work so can you talk about that that through line too in the film yeah the drug war you know um, it, uh, candidate the Duterte right mm -hmm. when he was running for president he promised the drug war. He promised that he would get each and every drug pusher, drug kill, every, you know, that was, he ran on that, right? And he made 
good and his promise. But no one, I think, ever really understood that it was extrajudicial killings, right? He was going to, the basically, the police is, like, allowed to go out and without any due process, gun down alleged, right, drug users and drug killers uh, and drug pushers. The poor. The poor, yeah. yeah. And they're extrajudicial because they don't go through the due process. But the narrative of the police is that they fight back, you know, but uh, forensics show that they they don't have, I mean, they don't have the means to fight back. The police are armed, right? They're running away. So a lot of them are shot in the back. They're mm-hmm. not fighting back, right? right? They're running away. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's horrific. The numbers are like 27,000 extrajudicial killings, according to human rights groups. And before this film, I saw the film The Kingmaker. Yeah. And, I mean, there was obvious planting of evidence on film, which was insane. So, yeah. Thank you for capturing all of that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I, I wanted to talk about, uh, and I'm glad that you bring this up in the film. Um, you know, I have some family members in the Philippines, mm-hmm. and I asked them, like, how, what do you feel, how do you feel about, about Duterte? You know, because obviously it, it's horrible. We, we face this with our own president pretty much down to the T. I mean, the nepotism, the, the fake news, like, basically they're running from the same mm-hmm. rule book. Um, and my family members there as you spoke to in the film, we're like, well, you know, it doesn't affect me, and you know, there's less, and I'm just like, wait, what do you mean? And, and you speak to that, so thank you for, for talking about that and how that's, you know, that's, that's a dangerous way of thinking. Yeah, because I think the numbers are so horrific. I mean, they're so high, right, 27,000. It boggles the imagination. I, I think at some point that you stop thinking, you have to stop thinking about it to live in the country, right? Mm-hmm. But then, on the other hand, you can't. You can't afford to turn your eyes away because they will be coming for everyone, right? Where is the line that, mm-hmm. you know, they'll never stop, right? Mm-hmm. Now it's the drug pushers and drug dealers. They were talking about, you know, and then he went after the tanbais, the loiterers. They could, people couldn't loiter. But if you, if you look at the neighborhoods, those neighborhoods, like, encourage you to just, you know, you're sitting on the stoop because it's hot inside, so yeah, so when where where does it stop? They don't think mm-hmm. of impunity, right? Once mm-hmm. you give the government like a you know a means to kill and not question it, it doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. And I and I think I think that uh, Ruby, I think you're a great spokeswoman for mm-hmm. what's happening in in the Philippines and spreading your message and, and being socially conscious in your music. And, and I really appreciate that. So can you talk about your process of like? what's happening there and, and trying to bring it out here and, and making it mainstream. Um, I think with every work that I do with my music, I understand that as an artist, just like as a director or you know a filmmaker, um, the work that you put out, it's, it's on a larger platform and you're not essentially, when, once the product is out, you're not just speaking for yourself, you're also gonna be uh, influencing others. So when I do talk about what's going on in the Philippines, um, I try to do, you know, m- careful research on it and make sure that what I'm saying is um, not only positive but also unfiltered and unbiased, not not just having my opinions but realistic to what's actually going on. And um, with a lot of the work that I do too, I also am mindful that, you know, as a Filipino-American, a lot of people, especially in my age group and um, within my generation, we don't really have that connection anymore to the homeland. And I want to make sure that, you know, it's important that what's going on over there is very real and we should care about and we should um, know about what's going on over there because it directly affects us and it's like what you guys have been mentioning in in this conversation it's aligned with what's going on in this country as well Mm -hmm. well thank you so much for being here it's really been an honor appreciate it oh thank Thank you you for having us thank you it's great thank you Thank you so much to Ramona Diaz and Ruby Ibarra of the documentary A Thousand Cuts. Don't forget to check it out. It's streaming everywhere August 7th. And uh, yeah, I I really think Ramona Diaz is a fireball. She loved the whole bitch talk thing. She was like, we were talking about being Filipino. And (laughs) I mean, that's what she called it. (laughs) Uh, She, um, it was like she knew our entire relationship. Our dynamic. Yes. She knew right away. By our, um, I mean Shar and I's with yes, Aaron. Yes, yes. Our well, knows with the non-Filipino. Yeah, it, it, it helped Aaron figure out tactics on how to deal with Angie and I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to re-listen to this interview and take uh, more notes. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, but no, they, um, it's just always cool to be in an interview of like 
all women and it was just yeah. all Asian women. And, and I don't know, it's just, no, it, felt, it felt nice. It, felt it was good. definitely, well, it's definitely a proud moment, you know, being at Sundance and then being right. with uh other you know you know a successful filipino you know filmmaker and uh you know an artist like ruby which yeah. by the way it's like we've been wanting ruby on the show forever for like like a real sit down and interview yeah this was the first time we actually were able to connect with her in sundance right we're all from the bay Area. yeah <laughs> and you know uh obviously this one you know she wasn't um as prominent in the conversation as much as the other Sundance conversation we had with her but uh uh which we've already released haven't we yes Mm -hmm. yep we released that yep so yeah if you want to go way back there's another interview with just uh uh, you two and and Ruby and that was a crazy day because that's the day that Kobe died so it was just like a fucking (laughs) It yeah, that's a that's a hard day. You guys we lost, interv- almost lost my bag. We interviewed <laughs> oh, her that like too. We yeah. interviewed her the second after I found out that Kobe had passed. So I I really don't think I was really in that interview. Thankfully, Aaron carried it because I we were in a bar as well, and I could see the TV in the background yeah. like with Kobe's face while we were interviewing Ruby, and I was just like. I wasn't really there, but anyway, sorry, Charles. And and well, no, like in um, what's it called? I a thousand cuts was like the first movie from Sundance that I got to screen, quote unquote, because Angie and I watched it while we were driving over to to, to Utah. The yeah. yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. We watched it too. I tried to save because obviously there's no possible way you can one person can watch all the movies that they had to watch no or that we had to watch for sundance we covered 69 in total you know collectively right so i saved some for the drive and ones that i thought maybe Shar would enjoy and i was like oh let's let's watch about the philippines together and yeah we plugged the aux cable in so that i could listen because i couldn't exactly watch right <laughs> yeah. no yeah no. Um, no that was fun to watch it together though it was cool yeah, and I, you know, I, I had heard stories of what was going on in the Philippines, but didn't really know. And, and I, it's, it's scary. Um, it's a scary time right now, uh, politically and as a press person there. So, um, Maria so Ressa I, is like our, is like RBG, you know, the journalist version of RBG. Totally. Like, stay strong, stay protected, yeah. you know, keep fighting. We need you more than right. ever. We had a great conversation with Ramona. I really liked her a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, Ruby, um, who's, uh, who's, who's our homie, Bay Area homie, um, and really important that her song is, is in this film. So, so good. Yeah. And, and what a great surprise that, uh, we got to actually see her at Sundance. Cause you know, also to the point that, uh, we've only gone to Sundance two years in a row and who knows what the hell's going to happen in 2021, but there's not a lot of Brown people there. Uh, and there's way more men than women. So it was nice to, like Ange said, have a, have a table full of brown women uh, talking about film at Sundance. So hopefully there's more to come in that. And um, if we're going to wrap up, I just want to say thanks for listening. And don't forget to head to our website to sign up for our monthly e-news. We just sent one out. So you already missed August, but you can sign up for September. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show is edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. Yeah. If I fall, I stand up, break these walls, I rise up. Even when I lose it all, I always got my eyes up. They're praying on my downfall, but I'll never give up. A thousand cuts won't be enough to keep my fists in these cuffs. Uh. And I'm never breaking down when the odds against me. Brown girl, girl.